everyone welcome back to the professor moville youtube channel i'm here today to talk about chapter 12. this is for my consumer behavior folks we're going to talk about chapter 12 and chapter 12 is self-concept and lifestyle so those of you that took a look at maslow's hierarchy um, which was i believe chapter 10 um, basically, we're at the top of the pyramid at this point, okay? We're thinking about self-concept and what is our lifestyle attached to that concept. So let's jump right into the slides. Okay, so we have finally moved out of the internal and external influences. Can you believe it? Um, we are in the middle. We're smack in the middle. We are on slide two. And we are in self-concept and lifestyle. We've actually made some progress. Pretty crazy. So if we move on and start with slide four, we talk about self-concept, okay? Um, I think the book does a good job. We all have a private self and a social self, right? Um, our private self is that little voice inside our head. Right? It's that little voice that talks to really yourself and it's how you see yourself in the mirror, okay? Versus social self. So that's how others see you. You know, are you, are you the life of the party? Are you the person that everyone relies on? How do other people see you? That is your social self, okay? Um, moving on. To slide five, there's a little bit more um, regarding self-concept. This shows a um, print ad for Dove. Um, those of you that may not be familiar with the Dove brand, they do all sorts of beauty products, shampoo, um, the Dove bar, the soap bar, that's what made them famous. Um, they do deodorants, they do all sorts of stuff. They mainly focus on women, but I do know they have a... Um, they have a men's line as well. So one of the things that they focus on is beauty is for everyone. So what they show here on the slide is their campaign designed to bridge the gap between actual versus ideal. So many of you watch TV, especially now, um, look at stuff on your phone and you see models and athletes and they look a certain way well real people don't necessarily look that way right um so dove has a whole beauty is for everyone um, pledge it's a real beauty pledge um, they pledge three things that they will always feature real women in their advertisements never models they portray women as they are in real life so they don't airbrush the crap out of them i mean come on I lived, in, I lived in Los Angeles for four years, and simply because I lived there and I lived out right in the Hollywood area, I saw a lot of stars, and in person they look very different. Just saying. Um, they help girls build body confidence and self-esteem. Dove has had the, the uh, self-esteem project. They've had it for a few years, and they've educated 20 million young girls in body confidence and self-esteem, okay? So it's really important to marketers what we're thinking about ourselves, both our internal selves and our social selves. So moving on to slide six, we talk a little bit, we keep talking about self-concept, and we're talking about two different sets of individuals. So folks with an individual self-concept, they define themselves on what they've done, right? What they've accomplished, their accomplishments. Um, there could be their education or awards or jobs. Um, that really affects who they are and their own personal characteristics, okay? Um, individuals with interdependent self-concept those folks define themselves in terms of their social role right so family relationships things in common with other people in groups so um i'm a mom 
right? And so I definitely define myself as a mom. Um, I'm also a mom of a child with special needs, so I identify with that greatly and and meet other people and work and talk with other people that are in that same situation. And so I definitely feel that self-concept, the interdependent self-concept. I'm definitely more, I would say more connected to my social roles. My question for you would be, which one do you feel more connected to? And it could be both. Let me know. So moving on to talking about possessions. So um, if we talk about that, let's see, extended self, peak experience. So extended self is you plus your possessions. So as I've said before, people tend to um, talk about themselves, their accomplishments, what they've done, but they also like to talk about possessions look at this BMW, look at this big beautiful home. So possessions tend to be an extension of our self-concept. Um, a peak experience could be leaving the house, finally leaving your parents' house and moving away, um, having a child, uh, maybe getting married, um, that kind of stuff. And those types of big peak experiences drive us to buy things drive us to buy certain things and spend money right think about it it makes total sense you're gonna spend money on a baby right um, you're gonna spend money when you move into your first apartment right you're gonna buy all those pots and pans that you never had in college because you all have like one pan in your apartment that everyone shares I know who you are I know you're out there um, so other things like non-product entities, like activities, TV shows, people, teams, um, that can relate, right? So I could introduce myself, talk about myself a little bit and say, well, I'm an avid Packers fan, right? We tend to identify ourselves with things like that, with sports teams. How would you say you describe yourself? I would also say something like, I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, right? I think I've even said that in class. So there's the extension of possessions. There's also the extension of the non-product stuff too that's out there, okay? So moving on, we're gonna skip slide eight and we're gonna talk quickly about slide nine and that is self-concept, the relationship between self-concept and brand image. So. People's attempts to obtain their ideal self-concept, right? Because we're all striving for that ideal, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, often involve the purchase and consumption of products, services, and media, right? We're buying things. We're buying exercise equipment. We're buying um, uh, skin care. We're buying things to try to improve ourselves. So this slide, slide nine, really describes this process. So if you if you move left to right on this slide, you're gonna talk about product brand image. So there's a brand image. So if I buy that BMW, there's an image associated with it. Um, and then there's my self image. So I could be someone that's really driven by possessions or accomplishments and that's right in my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm driving the ritzy car. So then there's the relationship between self-concept and brand image. So how do those things marry, right? The status of the BMW that I'm driving in my neighborhood shows my accomplishments. Behavior. So seeking products and brands that improve and maintain self-concept. So I got that BMW for that reason. Maybe I'm wearing a Rolex. I'm not. I'm not even wearing a watch or any jewelry, but um, because I go nowhere, I'm home. Um, so quite frankly, folks, you can kind of see if, if they're in that luxury, um, if they're in that luxury genre of purchasing, um, you can kind of understand a little bit of their psyche. Um, satisfaction, so I love my BMW. I don't have a BMW, by the way, but my husband does, I don't. 
Um, I love it. And I, I'm enjoying it. And so that goes right back to self-concept. So these purchases feed our self-concept. Whether we know it or it's subconsciously in there, um, good marketers understand this about us. So the nature of lifestyle, let's, let's move on to slide 10. Lifestyle, how you live, right? Um, right now your lifestyle is probably vastly different than you thought it was going to be this time this year. Um, mine is basically the same. How sad, except I'm here all the time and I have to homeschool. Anyway, um, so what's your lifestyle? Tell me, I think that'd be a good question. What would you say your lifestyle is? So a lifestyle is basically how a person lives. It is how one enacts his or her self-concept. Influences all aspects of what you buy and it's determined by your past experiences, innate characteristics, and your current situation. So your lifestyle probably is going to be different than mine. I'm a married mom. I live in a, you know, average place. Um, we go on vacations. I have a wonderful job that I love. And um, yeah, I'm pretty happy. So that's my lifestyle. I drive a Chevy. I um, like to spend money getting my nails done. And uh, yeah, I like to buy a Starbucks here and there. That's basically where I spend my money. Although not much anymore. I've been making my own coffee. It's really good. Anyway, so I want to know what your lifestyle is. I don't know. It's a good question, right? Um, slide 11 just shows um, the target targeting the lifestyle of extreme sports enthusiasts. It's just workout videotapes or video uh, DVDs, videotape. What is this, 1988? Anyway, so again, that's all that is. So moving on to slide 12. Slide 12 is the lifestyle and consumer process. So it's, it's just moving left to right. So we have this list of lifestyle determinants. These are all things that you should be aware of. Demographics, subculture, social class. These are all things we've already talked about in class in all the various chapters, which then affects lifestyle. So lifestyle, how we live. Demographics, subculture, values, emotions, all those things, that affects our activities, our interests, attitude, our feelings, okay? So this whole book is like a layer cake. It's just building, building, building layers. Your internal, your external influences, how they flow right through to your self-concept and lifestyle, okay? And then it shows your impact of, on behavior. So purchases and consumption. So all of those things, your lifestyle determinants, your lifestyle, how does that affect how you buy, right? Um, if you are very tech savvy, maybe wealthy, you maybe buy a lot of things online or you have people that make those purchases for you. So there's a lot of different pieces to this. So this is just a good left to right of, of the process. So this slide is mapped out on page 442, um, the measurement of lifestyle. So psychographics. Psychographics is a term um, that is also used interchangeably with lifestyle. So both of them are used interchangeably. So you may hear psychographics, you may hear lifestyle. Psychographics has been discussed, was discussed in earlier chapters. We also talk about it in Marketing 250. So psychographics were things like, I like to play tennis and I know a bunch of people that like to play tennis. That's our psychographic, that's a lifestyle we have. We're active, we're healthy, we really enjoy tennis, we buy tennis magazines and tennis equipment and so that's our psychographic. So the word psychographic you're going to hear interchangeably with lifestyle. Um, all the rest of this stuff, attitudes, values, demographics, I'm not going to read through all of that. Those are all terms that we've been using through this book as well as in Marketing 250 and other marketing courses. Usage rates is probably the only one I would touch on 
and that's just um, cus consumers categorized as heavy, medium, or heavy, medium, light, or non-users of a product. Okay, so that's probably the only one that's a little bit off here on this slide. So moving on to slide 14. So slide 14 introduces two, uh, two specific lifestyle schemes, uh, luxury sports cars and technology. So we're gonna talk about Porsche specifically um, with the luxury sports cars. So slide 15 kind of breaks it out. It's also in the book and basically uh, Porsche consumer segments were broken out into these five categories. Uh, top Guns, Elitist, Proud Patrons, Bon Vivants, um, and fant fant Fantasists. I think it says Fantasists. So what I want you to do is take a look through these. Pretend you were in the market for a Porsche. Which category would you fit into? Which category do you think you would fit into? Pretend you have the money for it. Pretend you're ready to rock and you're ready to buy that really cool 911 Porsche. Which category would you fit in? I thought about this for myself. And quite frankly, I would probably fit in to the last category. Fan Fantasis. Why can't I say that word? Um, this, car, this group uses their car as an escape not as a means to impress others. In fact, they feel a bit of guilt for owning a Porsche. I'm telling you that would be me. I'm not a big fancy car lover, but would it be cool to just get in a Porsche and just drive really fast somewhere and just kind of get away from it all? Yeah, it would be really fun. It'd be very cool. So I think that would be me. I don't see myself in the other categories. Where do you see yourself? That's the question. So the other one is technology, and I think this one's really, really interesting because how technology is used by consumers is so important to marketers, right? Think about it. If we didn't have technology, what, how would we be doing this? How would I be able to deliver you all of this quality content? <laughs> all of this content. I mean, think about it though. It's so important, and so it's important how people buy. These tech segments were put together um, by a company, Experian Information Systems, that's all in the book. So the four categories of tech segments, the wizards, the journeymen, the apprentices, and the novice. So the wizards are the technology as life people, right? They're the ones that buy the latest stuff. They're usually young adults, um, students. Um, you guys are the ones that are willing to try things. I definitely put my husband in this category. He's always the first to have the newer phone, the latest camera, um, the equipment to record something like this, right? Um, so yeah, wizards. Journeymen, so technology is an important part of my life. So I consider myself a journeyman. Um, the demo on this is young and established adults, and I found it very interesting that they said the average age was 43. You know, me and Shakira would be in this category. Um, household income average, 100K. They do a lot of online shopping. Um, apprentices, technology is changing my life. So that demo is established and middle-aged adults, they're willing to take advantage of tech and are willing to learn. Um, the fourth one is novices. Technology has a limited effect on my life. They're disconnected from emergent technology. They want simple, easy to use devices. So that's more mature adults and retirees. Email is one of the few activities they know how to do. That would definitely like be my mom. She knows how to use her phone. She knows how to use email, but you know, you start to get into like trying to use Zoom and everything else and that 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 can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, moving on to slide 17, we're just going to talk about these two general lifestyles um, schemes, the VALS system and the GEO lifestyle and uh, analysis or prism we'll just call it prism so if we move on to page 18 this just explains the veil system so it's a classification of adults 
into eight consumer segments. The consumer segments are on that page. They're in the book if you want to really drill in deep. But I mean, we've talked about a lot of these terms before. Innovators, achievers, strivers, survivors. Survivors are have low resources, lower income. So if you want to spend a little more time digging into that, I, I'm not going to go super deep um, in, in this lecture. Um, Vales is based on psychological characteristics that correlate with purchase patterns. Pretty simple stuff. Data, data, data. Um, people are classified according to their primary motivation. So the next slide talks about three primary consumer motivations. Um, ideals motivation, achievement motivation, and self-expression motivation. So ideals motivation these people are guided in their choices by beliefs and principles. They want functionality and reliability, right? They, they don't really care about social approval. They just want something that does what it says it's going to do and it works and it's reliable. Um, achievement motivation, these are the folks that care about social standing and um, social position. They're, they purchase status symbols like the BMW or the Porsche. Uh, they care about the approval and the opinions of others. They really do. They care about that. Um, Self-expression motivation. These folks express their individuality through choice. So these are the action-oriented folks. They purchase experiences. Okay. Um, which one of these do you think you would be? Or which one would you say that you lean towards? Um, I think... I think it's a, it can also be a very, this can be a very fluid, these motivations. Like it de can depend on the product, the service. It could depend on where you are in life. For me right now, I just want to buy something that does what it says it's going to do and does it all the time. So I probably fall into the first category. I also do feel like spending money on experiences just feels better to me than stuff, um, especially being trapped in my house the last couple weeks and realizing that I just have so much stuff that I don't even realize I have. So definitely experiences I think are important. So which one would you be? Um, this next slide, slide 20, takes a deeper dive into the three primary consumer motivations. So it kind of breaks it out a little bit. It's basically what we just talked about. But it kind of, I, I really like this. It's also in the book, it's table 12-3. So it kind of walks you through. So if you talk about um, ideals, the one that I tend to feel like I'm closer to. So they are information seeking. They buy functionality and reliability. They seek understanding. They pursue self-development. They resist impulse. They ask, what should I do? I really like that. I think that's a good way to kind of map these three out. Okay. So moving on to, to slide 21, we're going to talk a little bit about PRISM. So PRISM is a state-of-the-art geodemographic classification system from this company called Claritas that merges the U.S. Census data with product consumption and media usage data, okay? So it's this company that merged all this data and poof, right? So there's an underlying logic to it, um, people with similar cultural backgrounds, generally gravitate toward one another. I mean, how much money did they make coming to that conclusion? Um, they choose to live amongst peers and neighborhoods offering compatible lifestyles. I mean, a lot of this falls under the category of duh, but it is kind of good to see what happens when all that data is put together. Is it really what we think? And kind of yes. So think about this in your own life. Would you agree with those statements? Um, page 22 talks about the life, social and life stage groups. So basically the social groupings are based on where you live. Urban is a city, like New York City. Suburban would be the areas surrounding a large city. So like, I don't know, Syosset, Scarsdale areas around New York City. Second city would be smaller, less densely populated cities. So like Syracuse or Buffalo, or Albany, Rochester. Um, town and rural, so low density towns and rural communities. 
So like Oswego or Dryden or Cortland, okay? So that just breaks that out. Um, same with the social and life stage groups, younger, family, and mature, obviously. You know, all of us are in our younger years. I'm not. It's fine. I'm not, I'm at least not in my mature years, okay? Um, this last slide, slide 24, the Geo Lifestyle Analysis. So the book talks about six specific prism segments. So network neighbors, young diggerati, big fish, small pond, pools and patios, golden ponds, and young and rustic. So as we talk about these segments, think about how you would market to them and why these classifications are necessary, okay? So that would be a good topic for your comments. So network neighbors, suburban wealth, um, million dollar homes, private clubs, fancy cars, um, manicured lawns, married couples with kids, graduate degrees, high tech use, six figure incomes, they play golf and tennis, they use LinkedIn, they drive accurate. okay? Um, young Diggerati, tech savvy, they live in like hip urban fringe neighborhoods, they're educated, they live in trendy apartments with cool gyms and shops and restaurants. I used to be this person. I'm not this person now, but um, they go to juice bars and coffee bars and micro brews. Um, they hike, backpack, they drive Audis, and they use Uber. Uh, big fish, small pond, older, upper-class, college-educated professionals. They become leaders in their smaller communities. They, um, they're upscale, empty nesters. They maintain large investment pro, uh, portfolios. They watch a lot of CNBC. They drive uh, a Lexus, okay? Um, pools and patios. Middle-aged suburban folks in stable neighborhoods that have a pool or a patio. <laughs> um, they're white-collar managers, professionals, plumbers. Um, they have a, they're above-average tech users. They do a lot of research and shopping online. They and their kids play soccer. They own a Nissan. Okay, does that paint a picture? Um, golden Ponds. So those are retirement folks. They live in smaller towns, they downsize their lives, they live in small apartments, they collect social security, they watch Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, they play bingo, um, they like the Weather Channel, and they drive Buicks. I like the Weather Channel. Uh-oh. I also like to watch Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. I don't like bingo, not yet. I'm heading there. Um... And the last one, young and restless, I believe. Yeah, young and rough, young and rustic. I don't know why I said restless. Um, they're singles and young families in rural areas. They love the outdoors, hunting, um, ATVs, but they're also video gamers. They're big video gamers. They follow NASCAR and monster trucks. These folks shop at Walmart. They drive a Chevy. They probably watch Duck Dynasty. I don't know. Um, so. Going through these six, these sample prism segments, these six segments, how would you market to these people? Why are these classifications necessary? Why do we as marketers feel the need to do this and figure out how people are living, what they're watching on TV, what their lifestyles are, right? Let's have a conversation about that. I think that's an important, that's probably the most important piece out of this chapter, okay? Um, I think that's all I have for chapter 12. Um, please, um, please like and subscribe <laughs> and comment below. I'm not the best YouTuber, am I? I'm trying. Um, that's all I have and I will see you next time. So in the meantime, be safe, be well, and I'll see you soon. Bye now.